Hey, everyone. Hi. Uh, it's 3.40. I think we should start. Uh, hello, and thank you, for, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Deep Kapadia. Uh, I work at the New York Times. I'm here with my colleague, Tony. And we wanted to give you a brief overview of how Cloud Native Computing Foundation and some of its projects, specifically Kubernetes, has helped us sort of build a, a much more developer-centric culture at the New York Times. So um, without further ado, um, So this is this is pretty much what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what it, what, why the New York Times needs a more developer-centric culture. What is what is our enterprise comprised of? Uh, how do we go about transforming and planning uh, to move to the cloud? Um, what are some of uh, uh, some of the culture shifts that we made? Uh, usually, when people think of the New York Times, they think of the newspaper, but it's a lot more than that at this point. Um, but I mean, to, to give you some context, like this is, this is what our website looked like in 1996. Uh, there's, a, there's a line below that says, please open your window to the width of the line of this text, uh, which is interesting. The first New York Times website launched in 1996 and was essentially a, a GIF that was put on www.nytimes.com, and, uh, and then since then, we've had a lot of organic growth. Uh, in 2016, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided that we didn't want to run things in our data center anymore. It didn't make sense for us. It, like, we, we build news apps. We build apps to sort of uh, inform uh, our end users, our, our, our readers. We don't need to be managing data centers, we don't need to be in the business of uh, being, uh, being super technical about that. Um, so we migrated about 300 plus apps to Amazon and Google Cloud. Um, we just ended our migration in April of this month, which was last month, pretty, pretty much. So, so we were completely shut down, we completely shut down our data centers Last, last month. And in the process, we shut down about 140 plus apps and we migrated 300 apps to Amazon and Google. Um, so this is what the website looks like today. We don't ask you to open the website to the width of the browser. It, it adjusts. Uh, there's, uh, but there's a lot going on there. Like there's, there's like there, you see some ads, uh, uh, you see like section fronts, you, 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 you see different types of Articles, there are videos, slideshows, et cetera, et cetera. So like, there's a lot of moving parts here. There's also like a search bar somewhere up there, yep, up in the right corner, uh, which powers like a, a pretty large search function that goes all the way through our archives, all the way dated back to 1851. Uh, so yes, we digitized our, our archives at some point as well. Um, so, there, so there's a lot here. Uh, what we also do is for specific events, we have uh, we have specific applications so for specific news events like the Olympics. Like we want to get real-time updates about what's going on in the in the Olympics, but at the same time, we also want to surface some important stories, collect, uh, uh, create a collection of some stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that so we do we do a lot of this. So so this itself it becomes an app for our for our uh, for one of our teams. Um, we do similar things for elections. Uh, the result didn't quite go the way I had intended, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but I mean, the, like the, the elections is really, really complicated. Like we're, we're basically uh, receiving live voter data at any, uh, like um, the, the data is constantly polled and collected, and like you know the site needs to be updated, and we need to be. We need, we, we need to be really, really quick about updating the site as well. And we get hit with massive amounts of traffic on election nights. So we have to scale the election app very, very differently compared to some of the other things that we do. So, so we, we have to take these things into consideration. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is like the New York Times is evolving, becoming more and more complex. Uh, like 
like any other news organization. And then we have our new products and ventures. At some point, we decided that we were doing a lot of these recipes. We were actually publishing a lot of recipes, but we decided it might be useful for people to, to collect their recipes, annotate them, share it with their friends. So there's a whole cooking app now. Uh, the New York Times crossword has a life of its own. Uh, that's me trying to uh, solve the crossword last night. I was very, very unsuccessful. Uh, but there are people who actually like wait for the new crossword to be published and, and actually just go at it the, the minute they get it. Uh, the crossword itself has its own like profit and loss account. It's 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 its own thing. Uh, but this is something that we do. We build it. And then there's all the things that that power everything. Like there's a. There's a, a content management system where our news reporters and editors are constantly editing stories and, and actually sharing them with each other or collaborating on them. Uh, there, there's an editorial workflow that we need to account for. Uh, there's, um, uh, I mean, we also are a for-profit business, so we, we have subscriptions. Uh, then there's the archives, as I mentioned. There's advertising. There's, uh, uh, there's, there's the mobile apps. Uh, the, the mobile apps uh, are, are pretty different. Like they're powered by by, mo by APIs that that need to be scaled when like people get a breaking news alert uh, and and start hitting our APIs. At one point, we we had we had our mobile apps be the number one cause for for our DDoSing our servers. That's not the case anymore, thankfully. <laughs> uh, so so there's a so there's a lot to sort of uh, process, and I'm not, I'm not even uh, going really deep. But there are, there are a lot of issues with the way we built apps in the past. Um, one of the things was um, our internal IT infrastructure team, which was responsible for managing people's desktops and computers, eventually morphed into uh, uh, an ops team that was managing our website, our, our, our DNS. Uh, that's a very different skill, like managing internal IT versus managing a website that needs to scale on demand and you know, uh, help developers move really fast. Uh, so also there's like changing in consumption habits, et cetera, that, that required us to change the way we, we did things. So, like we we tried we tried moving to the public cloud at one point we we sort of had this notion that like we won't be able to scale come come 2015 2016 like we we need to move much faster uh we started dabbling in AWS but the uh but but it was just an experiment at the time we we didn't we 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 still had a lot of um, expertise in running our own data centers so we never tried going too far with AWS. We ran things in AWS as we would run things in our data center, which means access was closely guarded. People would have to actually provision machines before they could do anything. Uh, there was not a whole lot of automation built into uh, uh, our provisioning process. There was not a whole lot of automation in our build process. We did go through uh, a, 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 a org-wide CD effort, like we, we said, oh, continuous delivery, that sounds like a good idea. Everyone do continuous delivery. And you know, we, we brought in some consultants, they helped us quite a bit, they helped us understand uh, the basic concepts, but then we left it to the teams to figure out what continuous delivery meant for them, which means our, our deployment stacks completely fragmented. We had at one point five, five to six different ways to deploy applications to AWS. That was not desirable because you know different teams were moving at different paces. Different teams had different levels of maturity. We couldn't, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't move fast enough. So we decided to revisit the decision in 2016 and say, where are we with this? Like, what are, what do we want to do? And uh, there was a lot of increasing frustration amongst people who were more familiar with new DevOps concepts, people who were interested in running things in containers, people who were reading about Kubernetes or Mesos or, and things like that, and were like, oh, we should be doing this. Why are we not, why are we not getting on this bandwagon? <laughs> uh, 
uh, there's, there's a lot of desire to go use things like Terraform, use infrastructure as code, manage secrets in a much better way, rather than checking them into your Git repositories. Uh, there, there's, there, there was a lot of things that we wanted to change. There were some teams that dabbled in things like Nomad. And, uh, there, were, there, there were a lot of things, uh, teams that uh, tried to dabble into Mesos, Marathon, Nomad, et cetera, but uh, those were one-off efforts and were not very cohesive. So we, we formed a team of people who had been doing these efforts in small silos. And we decided to actually work with the individual teams to help them improve their level of maturity using common tooling, common ways of doing things. And we, we formed what we now call the delivery engineering team, which, of which Tony and I are a part of. So what we are is very well depicted by this picture and this is from Greg, whose last name I cannot pronounce ever. Uh, 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 his blog, he actually wrote a really good blog about uh, what is delivery engineering. Around the same time when we were thinking about actually doing something very similar. And the idea is we don't manage people's production code. We don't, uh, we don't actually take someone's code and say, here, we're going to run it on the server or in this Kubernetes cluster or anything of that sort, we will create a pathway for them, for them to get their code from their laptops all the way to production. And that includes uh, common tooling, common deployment mechanisms, uh, you know, a, a common way to manage secrets, et cetera, uh, a common way to provision your infrastructure. A lot of this is just exactly depicted in the picture where, like, these guys actually create a path for the person throwing the puck or whatever it's called. Um, I'm, I don't know much about curling, but that picture is really good. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we basically standardized on some, some ways of doing things. We, we basically said we want to have a Git-driven workflow. We, we all use GitHub. Uh, at the New York Times, so we, we said, and, and GitHub provides us with all kinds of bells and whistles for us to be able to manage our workflow. Let's use that. Let's not push uh, buttons and Jenkins to deploy manually. Uh, secondly, we decided to move away from Jenkins. Everyone was managing Jenkins at the New York Times, and more time was being spent managing Jenkins than actual product building. And we, we said we don't want to do that. We, at one point, we had about 100 plus Jenkins slaves running around uh, 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 running under people's desks or things like that, which we didn't want. Uh, does that sound familiar? No. <laughs> uh, instead of clicking buttons in AWS, we said we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we are able to provision our infrastructure much quicker, much easily. So we decided to use Terraform for that. And then actually manage secrets. Like this, this was actually one of the biggest uh, overhauls we did. Is like get people away from uh, their esoteric ways of managing secrets, passing secrets around in PGP encrypted files, or sometimes not even just like people would share secrets in Slack, uh, or people would like check secrets into their Git repos. Every time a Git repo got exposed for some reason, it was like. It was us going through the drill of man, uh, yanking out the secrets, cycling them out. It was, it was really, really bad. And at the same time, we realized a lot of these tools that, that I mentioned up, up here are all written in Go. And that allowed us to hire for a certain skill set as well. So, so having those standards was really good because we, we, we could gravitate towards one single set of tooling. And then Tony can t uh, talk a little bit about how we do this, how are we able to sort of get all of this uh, synced up, and, and how does it look like for a developer team today? Cool. All right, thanks, Deep. Uh, so I'm Tony. I work with Deep as a SRE at the New York Times. So um, like Deep said, in 2016, as we were doing this evaluation, we had a team that was rewriting our web platform, actually. So the NewYorkTimes.com, uh, what you see on your phone and laptop today. So uh, because they were doing this rewrite, um, we came up with this idea that we kind of are familiar with, uh, the Heroku-style idea. 
Um, and we put together a POC where you take your code, you just commit it, you push it, and then voila, it's on, it's live. You don't need to do anything else. Um, so we want to do this because we want to keep the local development experience simple and straightforward and let automation do the heavy lifting. And if we can prove it with this team, that means we can stamp out this process as a pattern across the organization. So um, I'll do a live demo. If it goes wrong, then I'll just play a backup video. So the live demo. Um, so here I have my, oh, it's not mirrored. OK, so I'm looking at the thing. So here I have my terminal. Um, I have an app that's just saying hello, showing you some uh, variables that I passed to it and, and some environment variables and stuff like that running on GKE. Um, I have a dev endpoint and a prod endpoint. Um, I'll refresh this so you know that they're live and up and running. And then here I have some code. So um, like I'm an everyday developer. I want to update some stuff. So I'm just going to open my text editor. And instead of hello world, I'm going to say hello from GKE, kube, con. Europe. And then save that. And then let's say, um, like Deep said, we took secret management seriously. So we wrote this thing that would fetch uh, values out of Vault and then inject it into the container. So for this case, our page, the background color, is actually sourced from a default white. Environment variable, as you can see in production, is yellow. And then in Vault, we're going to set it to green. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncomment this. Um, sidecar container that fetches values from Vault. And then, so I made the changes. And then I'm going to push these to uh, production. But before I do that, um, here I have an instance of Vault running um, locally. And then I'm going to proxy this Vault so that, oh, OK, let's see. Um, OK. Here is a live demo of God striking on me. Uh, I mean, I am connected to the internet. Is Servio down? All right, let's do. Um, uh, what's the other port tunneling thing? Ngrok. There we go. All right, so we're going to use Ngrok instead. This is a live and prompt improvisation. All right, so instead of Servio, we're going to use Vault uh, and Grok. Oh. All right, so uh, we have Vault ported through, and then so. I'm going to do vault right. We're going to set the color to green. Oh. All right, demo gods, come on. <laughs> Export. OK, so it's going to pass it to my local right green. If we read it out, it says green. All right, so let's hope this works. So I'm going to add my changes as any developer would. Git commit. We're going to get the color from Vault. And then we're going to push it into GitHub. All right, so now that it's pushed into GitHub, um, what our system actually does is it will trigger a build in our CI CD pipeline. Is the website working? There we go. All right, so it's going to trigger our CI CD pipeline. This is drone. Um, what it does is it's connected to GitHub via the webhooks, and it's going to clone the repository down, run our tests on it, build a binary, and we can notice that we're actually building the binary and passing in the git SHA of this commit so that this binary is immutable and tagged with this commit. And then what we do is we package the binary into a Docker container like you would any other. We're also going to tag this um, Docker container with the git SHA of this commit as well. Let me just copy that. Show. There we go. And then after that, what we do is we template out our deployment uh, manifest with the git shots as an image that we want to deploy. It actually prints out the templated manifest so that we can verify that, sure, we're running our um, sidecar container and everything else. And then it actually does some dry run validation and then applies it to the um, cluster. So as we wait for it to roll out, um, after it rolls out successfully, it's going to post in Slack 
the status. So there we go. And then it's going to have the status posted. So now if I actually refresh dev, um, we can see that it turned green. So let's say we want to promote this now to production, right? Everybody loves the color green. Let's change it so that it's not yellow anymore. Um, what we would do is we would actually just go into GitHub, um, and then in our code, we would draft a new release and say 2.0, because 2.0 is always better than 1.0. And then we just publish this release. When we publish this release, what it does is the, is the same thing as uh, when we, what, we, what happened when we push the git, but instead, the triggers are slightly different. Because we built the binary in the container already, and the container is in a registry, all it does is it, it templates out the manifest for Kubernetes with the same git shop, because we just tagged on the same git shop, and then it templates out the manifest, but applies it to the production cluster instead, and then once it is deployed, um, we'll see it notify us in Slack again, and then we can refresh the page um, in here. So you can see this is a git that I just, I just created, right? 3a something, whatever. So this is the old one. So once this is complete, if I refresh production, it turns green. And then a rollback is simple as going into our demo or going to our CI CD pipeline, selecting the previous deployment, and then just get out of here, pressing restart. And then so once this build restarts, it creates a new run of our job, does the same thing, except this time with this git shaw, right, the previous one that we were looking at. And then once this finished deploy, which it just did, if we go back to production, and then there's, there it is. So this is something that we proved that could work. And so as a result, we decided to roll this out to um, all the teams that are looking to deploy to Kubernetes. And then as well as because Drone is a plugin, container plugin based CI/CD system, we, can, we also wrote plugins for Google App Engine and Terraform. So uh, we'll get into that um, a bit later. So what we wanted to do is the cloud is a different landscape compared to traditional data centers. Um, this means changes in the culture and the methodology of development must occur if we want to set ourselves up for a good position in the future. The multi-tenant nature of the cloud means networking and security has to be reimagined. Um, so how can we take advantage of various isolation levels in project organization structure to provide developer freedom? Um, and how can we do less to get more out of the cloud? So <clears throat> with this in mind, um, we use the cloud migration as an opportunity to improve how we develop at the New York Times. Um, it was easier to lean in and shift into this cloud-native mentality, um, and embracing this meaning meant improved developer experience, velocity, and productivity. It wasn't smooth sailing all the way, but here are our main takeaways. So we shifted the process of how we do things. Um, shifting service ownership meant each team moved on their own schedule during this migration. Um, providing them with their own GCP projects allowed them to experiment with freedom and feel ownership for the operation and reliability of their application. Creating self-service tools, as the SRE team does, for common tasks eliminated the back-and-forth communication of the ticket-based model that a lot of traditional infrastructure teams have. Um, documentation was critical to the success of these tools, because if no one knows how to use them, you're going to go back into a lot of back-and-forth communication. Um, educating developers on how to build modern apps allowed us to make the migration process both easier and kept the door open for leveraging new solutions in the future. Uh, so if you don't have a 12-factor application, you're not going to be able to connect to that fancy new service, pro service mesh proxy or um, configure your application to uh, read from Vault, for example. Um, working in the open gave visibility to other developers who were likely doing other similar things. This meant dependencies had clear expectations and could plan based on upcoming changes. So we wrote RFC, whoever had an idea would write an RFC, and all developers in the organization were open and welcome to comment on it and morph uh, how things were being made. Um, a lot of people are going to be interacting with GCP every day, 
Uh, so in-person training sessions were probably the most efficient way to onboard a lot of people at once to a technology. Um, this also helps satisfy many developers' personal or professional training goals. Um, developers are, you know, uh, people who like to learn and people who like to try things out. And having a professional guide them through a, a quick start or, uh, and to answer any questions is a great way to uh, boost their confidence and get them in, into it right away. So we also shifted our development experience uh, with velocity and developer control in mind. So we preferred consuming cloud-based solutions to managing or hosting tools and enterprise services, from things like databases and queues to Git mail servers and HR software. Um, each slice of mindshare from managing a dependency could be used to work on the product itself. We preferred using open source tooling like Kubernetes, Terraform, OpenAPI as to maintaining in-house built tools. This way people can change teams internally without much onboarding or friction because they already know how to do things the New York Times way, which is the way that everybody else in the world is doing it. So we began to ship faster and more frequently, which, our, uh, which the drone CI-CD system allowed us to do. Um, it allowed us to align on common, easily configurable pipelines. They're just, like, they're just YAML. Um, every step looks the same. You say which image you want to use, pass some arguments, or run some commands in that image. Um, and this was great because it closely reflected what a lot of paid services like Travis and Circle CI were doing. But because this is an open source project and we ran it ourselves, we had the uh, opportunity to be more flexible, change some things in the installation of it um, in, our, uh, in the platform. And for the newest version, uh, because we wanted to make sure the system was stable and in production state for our many teams that were going to consume it, um, we have onboarded 200 repositories so far. Um, and ex we are expected to exceed 400 repositories once everybody uh, converts their pipelines to this newest version. More than 50,000 jobs have come through this version since a year ago. Um, this ex excludes the thousands of bills that were in the first version, first iteration. And then in the last four weeks, as you can see, we've had 12,000 jobs. So not every job is a deployment, but it's some sort of build or some sort of tag or some sort of operation. Um, and I think when I made this was a week ago, so it's probably increased even more. Um, we decided to treat secrets like secrets. Uh, we, in Vault, we have 75 namespaces of secrets so far. Uh, they're used by 21 teams and 54 repositories. Each of these teams or repositories, the namespace means they have their own place in Vault, providing them again with ownership and isolation. So for example, if your team actually accidentally mucks up the secrets in that namespace, it's not going to affect anyone else. And then our Vault, our team, and the people who uh, are on call could go back and uh, fix and recover your secrets uh, without affecting anyone else. Um, the New York Times, as you know, like a lot of people visit the home page, visit article pages, all that stuff. Um, and before, this used to be a giant varnish VCL configuration file with a lot of logic and rules in it. Um, in this shift, we decentralized the CDN logic using, the fast, using Fastly CDN. Um, this meant individual teams can manage their CDN using standardized tooling that our team has uh, paved the way for and testing methods. Um, this broke up this one or like four giant uh, VCL files into 40 repositories, each with their dev stage and prod release cycle. Um, and this puts the control back to the teams that are actually the backends for those uh, various routing rules. We started budgeting in the open with budget configuration as code. Um, we wrote a little tool that uh, hopefully will uh, open source soon, but um, basically it's a YAML file. <laughs> Everything's a YAML file these days that um, you configure to say this is all the GCP projects that I want under this budget, and this is how much I'm allowed to spend it each month. And every time you hit one of those levels, it's going to post in Slack like that uh, or some something like that that tells you you've hit your budget. So if you hit your 50% budget and it's only a week into the month, you know something's wrong, and you should take a look at if there's runaway costs um, and if there's a stale resource or something like that. 
And because it's in Slack, and that's where all the developers are, this gives a constant concrete number and a reminder to developers to say, we give you the freedom of this GCP project, but with it, you have to be aware of your budget and how you're consuming the services in your project. So we also changed how we communicate. Uh, the del delivery engineering team shifted the approach of support for other developers. Um, in order to scale, we worked with early adopters a few teams at a time to make sure that the path that we're paving is in the right direction and with the right tools. Um, by sharing responsibilities and goals, we could prove the concept and pave this path and spread the knowledge to developers, who would then spread it to the developers that they interact with. Uh, we ran office hours, which allowed us to answer questions with the um, chance to continue working on projects if no one had any questions that week. This also meant that developers can learn off each other when they're present in the office hours. Since then, many cross-organization teams have also adopted office hours. Um, we must, the delivery engineering team, we must always be learning because the technology is constantly changing, as you're aware since you're here at this conference. Um, by the time the developers of products gain grasp of the tools and the documentation, we need to be thinking about solving their next needs and anticipating what else they need. Because if you wait until they're experts, it's too late. They've, you can't uh, beat them to, to it anymore. Um, turning things off relates to the use it mentality. So as Dee mentioned, we shut down like 100 something uh, services. Uh, what this means is this reduces the burden in Mindshare, again, from developers, keeping teams focused on their primary products that actually generate value and revenue for the company. Um, our CTO did a great job because every time we would shut something down, he would give an email blast out, and that got us uh, excited. Um, and our team reviewed survey results to figure out what was working and what wasn't. Um, this effort took over two and what years. And um, once we got more and more teams onto our tooling, into the documentation, we needed to figure out if what we're writing is actually solving their problems, anticipate what kind of uh, future problems they'll have. So this is what um, Google Forms and having consistent, measurable, like quantitative-based uh, questions in the Google Forms allowed, us, allowed our team to see if we're improving quarter over quarter in our tooling and support. So that was all the stuff that we have done. And of course, there's still some stuff that we still have to do. Um, one large focus for our team is to continue our education in site reliability engineering practices and sharing them with both product and development. Um, this includes fostering a shared view of responsibility for the application's reliability. We demo and lead sessions to define service level objectives and application assessments so that we can provide feedback to teams who are keen to learn and understand what these best practices are um, and track them over time. Um, we're working on, uh, in terms of reliability, uh, service level objectives themselves are useless without indicators. You can set an objective, but you have to be able to measure it. So defining a path for monitoring, like how we did with ownership and deployment, is what we're working on next. Uh, we want to provide a platform for teams too small to manage their own Prometheus instance or their own um, data collection and so that we just take some config that they provide to us and we will fetch the data, the metrics for them and create these uh, dashboards for them. Um, so now that the migration is complete, we're exploring new features and updating non-ideal processes while product developers return and focus to focus on feature work. Um, a big topic is how to scale on-call responsibilities to reduce the burden on smaller teams. If you have a team of three people, it's going to be really difficult for you to be on-call compared to a team of 20 people because you're going to get that uh, anxiety about the pay pager every, like, at least once a month. Whereas if you're on a bigger team, you can uh, relax and, and focus on feature work or responding to requests um, a lot easier. So we're trying to figure out how to efficiently handle this. Um, 
we can't just, the SRE team can't just onboard everybody's applica 300 applications and say you're off the hook now because that's not scaling. Um, we're also looking to enhance our support of Google App Engine and diversify supported paths and platforms such as uh, Amazon's EKS and uh, Fargate. Um, we are ramping up our test automation team, uh, looking to integrate testing even more closely with development, release, and monitor, monitoring cycle. Uh, we're looking at ways to reduce manual testing while improving developer confidence. Um, one of the big tools that we can use for a lot of this uh, is BlazeMeter. It does performance testing for applications, and we're looking to integrate that into our uh, CI-CD pipeline that we demoed. And of course, we are looking to integrate even more cloud-native uh, technologies. This doesn't mean taking the latest and greatest and then running alphas in production. Um, we've learned that it's okay to wait and uh, to adopt cloud-native technologies. Often they get better and easier to use over time. Um, but sometimes you're put in a position where you need to move fast or you have a time uh, deadline that you need to meet. So you will have to experiment, contribute back to the community um, to get there. Uh, Istio is a tool that seems to cut across many of the concerns that um, we have. So that's something that we are looking at along with a lot of the other things you, I'm sure you've been hearing uh, today and will tomorrow. Um, so the CNCF, uh, we are an end user uh, member of the CNCF, and we're very grateful for the CNCF community, which is all of you and the foundation. Um, it's an advocate and supporter of standard and open tooling, something that we really like, uh, of best practices, and of course, of vendor support. Um, this gives us confidence to make those technological choices, knowing that there's a community who will face the same struggles and reap the same successes as us. So um, working at the New York Times, is you kind of are an agent of change. Um, if you're keen on what we have talked about and want to help us build on these tools, help us build trust and confidence in our systems, um, we're hiring. So um, you know, visit this. We also try to document a lot of what we do in our blog, um, blog posts. And a big shout out, of course, goes to the rest of the delivery engineering team who's not here today, who are still doing all the good stuff. Um, the product and development uh, people at the New York Times for learning and executing this cloud migration, and um, the leadership who put the resources towards actually doing this. Um, so there's our contact information. Feel free to hit us up on Twitter or email us. We'll be outside after the session if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs>